Everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarian, and this week we have a very special guest, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of Paul's, and a friend of the shows. The one, the only, Mary Jo Foley. How you doing, Mary Jo? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back. Uh, that was our take two. We had to attempt it twice because it the video was. froze, and and uh, you warned me. You warned me that this would happen. Yeah. Do we, Skype. Do we blame it on the weather? Here, it's it's awful here in New York. It's so <laughs> muggy. It, apparently, it's it pouring is. in Manhattan. Uh, yep. Not not yet here in Queens, but uh, it's it just brutal this summer here in New York. <sighs> yeah. You don't make the trip out to the, Ham- to the Hamptons? You don't just run away from yeah. the city? I don't care about that. I, I'm just like, yeah, you know what? It's kind of fun to be in Manhattan despite the heat because everybody else leaves. So it's really awesome to be here then. Uh, yeah, you come into Manhattan on like a Saturday afternoon mm-hmm. and yeah. it, it's like a ghost town. It's, it's actually terrifying if, if you've never experienced <laughs> it. Like there are certain weeks in august that you could go into manhattan and there's nobody i know like a sunday morning there are no cars no i mean it's it's bizarre it's so bizarre you may find a shoe in the middle of the street from the night before (laughs) uh but but that's about it that that's the craziest that it gets but i'm so glad that you're on today because there's so much happening in the world of microsoft in the world of technology uh you know windows 9 i mean this this is one of the biggest stories of the year really the the shift in direction at Microsoft over the last, you know, 24 months has been unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And and who better than you to to be on to talk about this? Um, before I talk about Microsoft with you, I I, I, talk, I spoke to Paul about this a couple of weeks ago, and it ended up becoming a very interesting discussion. And that's the change in journalism when it comes to technology, uh, when it comes to anything, but, but to kind of talk about technology a little bit. You've been covering this for a long time, and you've yeah. seen the shift happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Can you comment on that a little bit? Like, what have you seen change the most as far as covering technology over the last, you know, decade or so? Yeah, it's been crazy. I I actually tweeted this morning a milestone date that kind of puts everything in perspective. 33 years ago, IBM introduced the PC. Um, I've been a tech journalist for 31 years now. So I started doing this before there were really PCs. And um it's just kind of hard to even explain to anybody um, who's started covering it in the last decade, like how different it's become from when we first started covering it. So you're telling me you didn't have to go to another site and just copy and paste the entire thing? That's <laughs> not how it Surprisingly, I did not. I didn't even do any headlines like 30 things that you won't believe and guess what happens next? I never even got to write that headline. So I, yeah. I would like one like the top 20 beers a ter- tech journalist should drink by Mary Jo Foley. That, that's <laughs> the put, one I want. I'll, yeah, I'll do that on BuzzFeed. Maybe I can submit that as a, a contributed piece. Do you think, I mean, as someone that's been covering it for so long, I mean, last time you were on, you told, you know, we were talking about how you got into it, which has been fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, one of the most emailed, I guess, statements that I got about the last interview was, I had no idea MJ wanted to go to culinary school. <laughs> Yeah. Like, like that that blew people's mind and and you know that's like that that's the piece that I took from it. I'm like, you know what? That was awesome that we got that. Like I I yeah. found that out about you because I thought it was so awesome. But we spoke about how you started out and you know, you mm. were um you were on the campus of Microsoft riding the bus and you know, getting information. <laughs> but how has it changed for you? Has it gotten easier or is it kind of harder to kind of push through all the noise? Um I think it's more, it's harder in some ways and easier in some ways. So in terms of easier, I can say things like Twitter have really made my job so much easier. I was a huge Twitter doubter a few years ago and I didn't want to get on. And now that I'm on, it's just made my life so much easier as far as connecting with people and watching what's happening in real time. So that's been like something that has been a positive change. Uh, On the negative side though, it's really hard to get through the noise anymore because Within one minute of you posting something that might be a scoop or might be a scoop of perception, as we call things that aren't really product scoops, but more just kind of how you think about things. Um, somebody takes your story, they rewrite it, they put a headline on it, and they're on tech meme and you're not. You're not, yeah. Right. So, it, you know, it's a it's kind of a mixed bag. Do you um, get numb to that after a while? Like, it just happens yeah. so many times where, 
you're like, okay, this is just how it is. Like, yeah. what, what can I do? Even yeah, though it's for word for word. Yeah, for a while I was trying to email authors, especially if they um, took my story and misrepresented what I said. Like they not only stole it, but then they misrepresented what I said and, and made it sound like I was saying something I wasn't. And I'm like, hey, if you're going to steal my story, at least steal it accurately, right? Um, uh, but now I just kind of am like, oh, well, who cares? You know what? I'm, I hope readers are smart enough to go to the original source and know who has original sources and who's just regurgitating stuff from other sure. people. I mean, I think it's getting a little bit better in the sense that more people that have no journalistic background, I mean, like me, for example, I, I have no <laughs> background in this, but I'm aware to credit people when yeah. I get the information. I think a couple of years ago, people just didn't care and they didn't yeah. do it. I, I mean, I go on any of the websites and if it's a Microsoft story that's breaking, you'll see Paul Therod or Mary Jo Foley constantly. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like that wasn't the case, you know, a wa maybe five, six yeah. years ago where they wouldn't even bother crediting you. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I think has happened is um, we're not the only ones who break stuff on on Microsoft or any topic, obviously. And, you know, other sites break stuff and they want us to say they want us to credit them. Yeah. Um, so if you want somebody to credit you, you have to do it for them. I, I'll give you an example, and, and I, I experienced this for the first time a little over a year ago with the Xbox One announcement. Paul, I, I didn't even, it was a non-event for me. Paul said something about the Xbox One, and Paul and I had been discussing, it was the same thing that was said for, you know, five weeks prior, mm -hmm. I, and I can't even remember what it was at this point, but every, I mean, all these gaming sites picked it up. Yeah. I mean, it became a huge story where... It was on the front page of some Turkish newspaper, mm -hmm. and it said Windows expert Paul Thorat, and then it, it it whatever else, and it was a picture of me. I remember that. <laughs> I was the yeah. the Mid East friendly version of Paul Thorat, but like I found that funny. But the other side yeah. was there were so many articles that were written about what we said, and it was nothing that we said. We didn't yeah. even, I mean, the words never came out of our mouth, mouths and it, it's, this is audio, right? You can't get audio wrong. You could, right. you could kind of fill in the blanks when it's, you know, yeah. a, a, a paragraph about something. You kind of add a little here and there, but if it's just, if it's spoken, how do you do that? It's just people don't care. They're sloppy. Yeah. You know, again, I, I'm going to put this as a mixed bag. Um, I, there's been some really positive things about people who, have not got journalistic backgrounds getting into covering tech. I mean, Paul technically isn't a journalist, right? And it, I'm, you know, every day kind of astounded about how many things he writes and what he writes about. Um, so I don't think you have to be a journalist to get in this. And by the same token, I don't think you have to be a blogger to be credible in this either. And what I've really liked is getting to meet a lot of people who came at this business um, from the tech side and became bloggers. They've shown me a lot of things. They've shown me a lot of tricks for finding information. They've helped me fact check stories. They've, you know, clued me in when they had scoops so that I could write them up quickly and accurately. So I, I'm happy that uh, uh, the people who aren't journalists are in this field. And I hope they're happy that we're there too. And we can all kind of find our own place in this. Just, I think, then, I don't think you need to have the background. You're absolutely right. But I, I think if you're a little, just be, be a little ethical with the way that you do stuff. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, give credit where credit is due and don't take the stuff and just copy and paste it and put it on your website, which is yeah. very easy, you know, in 2014 to do. It is. Yeah. So, it, it you know, it's it, it's fascinating. I'm always fascinated by it. And for you, especially now with, let's say, Windows 9, for example, mm -hmm. it is really crazy because there's so many stories coming out there. So it many is. of them are fake. Uh, yeah. Many of them are not accurate. Uh, we were talking about those screenshots that were released. Mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to Paul Paul goes you know those aren't real it's not a real screenshot and I had no idea and every website was picking it up and posting as if it was real yeah uh so that happens so often how do you determine what's legitimate and what's not when it's coming into your inbox as, as some sort of hint yeah you know and that, that is something that's really tricky especially because um I think Paul gets this too we get a lot of tips that are anonymous yeah you know they we like you can't tell from who's sending them, but because of their name and the header, you can't trace back. 
is this somebody who actually knows what they're doing? Is this somebody trying to trick me and make me look bad publicly? So whenever I get a tip like that, I always make sure to go back to people who I know are my trusted sources on all things Windows and I'll run it past them before I, I say it's real. And I'll be like, hey, so what do you think? Is the charms bar really going to go away in Windows or no? Is that like crazy? And I wait to hear from them, even though, you know, it delays you posting a story. At least you you have a better chance of being right. Do you think it, it's because when you post it, when you delay it, obviously, if someone else posts it, they're going to get most of the hits and that's how it works. But because yeah. you are, you know, part of ZDNet, does mm-hmm. it not affect you as much as it would for, you know, uh, Microsoft blog spy dot com, you know, like something <laughs> like that, like it, it, because you have the credibility of a ZD net, does that kind of say, okay, you know what, if we wait, we got to check our sources, but it doesn't matter because people are still going to read it from us. Well, you know, I, I've been public about this before. The way we get paid on ZD net is we get paid by clicks. Um, so it, it's better for us to be first and early because we're, we're going to lose clicks if we're not, but I still feel like I'd rather be right than be first. And the reason I would is you, you start losing credibility and you start losing readers when you're consistently wrong. So I, I'm willing to take the hit on the hits just so that people still trust me and come to me because they value what I'm doing. Yeah. I, listen, when I, when I see an article and has your name, I know that it's legitimate. Um, I, it's never like, oh, well, I don't know if it's another source. I, and I think you and Paul both have that where your reputation yeah. speaks volumes for your credibility. Um, I, I'm always fascinated by how it works because like, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm just this dope that sits here and talks to himself for, you know, for a living. Like, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not providing any, I'm just, no, no, no vital information. Every now and then Paul say something and he's like, oh man, I'm going to get into trouble for saying that right now. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, you know, if I got that out of him, that's my job. And I did a good job. I, I, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm talking to myself all day. It's like, a, <laughs> I'm like a crazy person just rambling at the window. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at curtains and just rambling. <laughs> no, but you know what? Sometimes we don't even realize that what we have is a value. You know, like Paul and I talk on I am pretty much all day when he's not on vacation and I'm not on vacation. And we'll, I'll say, you know what? Did you hear this from any of your sources? And, and I'll be like, I don't think it's a big deal. And he'll be like, that's a huge deal. What do you mean that's not a big deal? And vice versa, right? So it's always good to have people who can kind of bring out things that you think are obvious, but but kind of make you see why they're not obvious and why they're worth writing about. Have you had a story come in and it was so ridiculous where you're like, oh no, this is impossible. It can't, that can't be real. And it turned out to be a legitimate story. <laughs> yeah, that, that's happened before. Um, and then I, uh, one you just made me think about was, um, man, this was a few years ago, but I, I remember um, I was interviewing somebody from Windows and he said to me, he's not working at Microsoft anymore. His name is Bob Muglia and he ran Windows Server at the time. And he said to me when we were having an interview, oh yeah, by the way, our strategy with Silverlight has changed. And he walked me through how Microsoft was basically going to back away from supporting Silverlight as a plugin. And I, at the time I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And then I was telling another friend of mine who was a journalist about this. And he's like, you're going to write this, right? Like, this is huge. And I was like, you know, I just thought it kind of made sense. And he's like, you should write this. And once I wrote it, it just took, took on a life of its own and went crazy. And people were screaming. It, it became this really big deal. And then Bob Muglia actually had to come. I, I give him a ton of credit for this. He came back and said in a blog post, you know, don't, don't kill the messenger on this one. Mary Jo quoted me accurately, and I did say this, and this is the truth. Yeah. Did he not even realize that it was that big of a deal? No, he didn't think it was either yeah. when he told me. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, and it's funny how that happens. You know, you say yeah. one thing, or you write one thing, and you're thinking it's a non-story, and it turns out to be a humongous event. I know. Yep. Uh, that's the amazing yep. thing about it. You know, you can't yeah. always have your finger on the pulse, right? I mean, and that that's how I see it. Like, there have been moments that we've, yeah. we've said something or done something, and it, it's... I'm just saying it, you know, and then two years later, people still bring it up. So yeah. you, you sometimes don't even know what's going on. That's um, true. I want to talk to you about Windows 9. Okay. Who better than you? Um, a lot's changing. Uh, a lot is happening. The last couple of weeks, we've gotten a lot of information. But because you cover the business side of things and enterprise a lot, it, are you getting the feel that this is, you know, this is it? Okay, thank God. They're fixing it. This is for us now. 
We don't have to yep. deal with the silliness <laughs> of Windows 8. And, we, you know, a lot of people have that idea. I just recently I installed Windows 8.1 on one of my laptops and I was using it. I'm like, wow, this is great. It's everything I want. I put classic shell on it and it's Windows. I don't have to worry about the, the, the modern UI. So is it more of a misconception of what Windows is or is it really that these people are having a difficult time adjusting to the modern UI and, and the changes in Windows? Um, I definitely feel like Microsoft is going back and fixing Windows 8 with, with Threshold, which, is, which we think is going to be Windows 9. And the reason they're doing this is very interesting. They, you know, when they came out with Windows 8, I think they had a very different view of how quickly everybody was going to move to tablets and how quickly people were going to want touch on all their devices. And now we're seeing the PC industry still has a lot of life left in it. And as soon as they started showing a lot of business customers Windows 8, they're like, oh, no, nope, not doing that. And if you look at where their money comes from, it comes from the enterprise more than it comes from the consumer segment of the business. They cannot alienate those people. And so I think they went back and said, wait, guys, we got to fix this because we can't afford to have a huge number of people when Windows 7, uh, when Windows 7 is no longer supported, just say, you know what, I'm not upgrading because I, I don't want this Windows 8 thing. And so they're going back and doing things I think they should have done before. And that make a lot of sense if you're a, a business user or somebody who wants to use a mouse and the keyboard and not necessarily touch as your primary way of interacting with the operating system. On the consumer side, you really don't have a choice, right? You go into a store and you're buying a laptop and it's a yeah. Dell or it's a Gateway, whatever it is. You're going to get Windows 8 and that's what you're getting. You're not going to say, well, no, I want Linux or, or yeah. I'm going to go and buy a Mac. If you're buying a Mac, you're buying a Mac and that's what you're going to purchase. It's not a I don't think it's an option when, when you're looking at a laptop for five hundred ninety nine dollars. You're not yeah. going to say, well, I hate Windows. I'm going to spend two thousand dollars and buy a Mac. But on enterprise, on the enterprise side, was their mindset, well, they're also stuck with this. So when it when 7 is done, when support is over for 7, they're going to have to come to us. So by that time, maybe they would have just, I mean, they're defeated at this point. They have no other options. So was that the mindset where they're going to have to update? They're going to have to upgrade eventually? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's what they're hoping, right? I mean... A lot, of, a lot of businesses have just moved to Windows 7, or some are even still in the process of moving to Windows 7. So, you know, Microsoft kind of had this window, no pun intended, of opportunity where they were like, hey, okay, it doesn't matter if they upgrade to Windows 8 the first year or even the second year that it's out. It is going to matter starting the next couple of years, though, when yeah. people are going to have to be planning for their migration and starting to move certain departments over. Um, if people keep holding on and saying, no, I don't want that, um, this is Vista 2.0, uh, then Microsoft is in a really tough place. Uh, your video froze again, so we'll try to get that <sighs> Darn back. Darn, again. <laughs> it, I don't know what it is. It, uh, it's it's it, something with Skype. Are you on desktop or are you on, uh, I'm my, on the Metro? I'm on my desktop. No, not on Metro. And um, I'm on a cable connection, too. So, so it should weird. be very good. That's so weird. Seems like more that? of a software it's... problem than anything else. Yeah, the beauty gotta, of the internet. I'm on the latest version. I know that. Blah. <laughs> so I'm just, I, it, what, I asked Paul this, and he, he gave a couple of reasons. But in your opinion, what is the, the main reason for the change from this mindset that, okay, this is our vision. This is what we're doing. Forget about desktop. This is the future of Microsoft to hang on. Uh, we need to we need to keep everybody happy. We're going to add this and we're going to add that. Is was it enterprise alone, or did they was it just a a change in in mindset within the corp you know the company? Uh, well, Windows management changed during this window. Um, so you know everybody pretty much who worked on the original Windows eight has either moved on, left the company, or been moved to another part of Microsoft. Um, almost almost everybody has at this point. So the new regime that's in there now, Terry Meyerson, you know, who came from Windows Phone and his guys who he's brought in as, as his inner circle, they have a different idea about what Microsoft should be and should have done regarding Windows. So I think that also is playing into this a lot. When, when they had the partner conference in Washington, D.C. recently, they made a point of standing up on stage and saying, when we come out with the next version of Windows, it's, you're going to be able to tell we talked to a lot of people about it before we, we released it, especially business users. And that wasn't really the case with Windows 8. With uh, with 
keeping it because initially they were going to add the start menu in eight, over the summer in Windows yep. 8, 8.1 uh, yep. update 2. Yep. Was it specifically a branding decision where they said, well, you know what? We need to kill this brand. It's not working. Even if we add the start menu, it's not going to help. So why don't we unveil it in the next version and make it into this big hoopla that, hey, look, all this stuff is back. This is the version you want. Was it that or was there other issues involved? I think it was that. Okay. Um, I think at some point they realized, uh, although they'll, they will not want to say this publicly, obviously, that, you know what, no matter what we do, people kind of already have made up their mind about Windows 8. It's and pissed all can, over again. We can fix it, but um, it doesn't matter. So we might as well hold the good stuff till next year. So you tell me we're not going to get like Project Mojave commercials <laughs> for Windows 8? I don't think, I don't think we're going to see that this time. <laughs> and you know what? It was brilliant. I mean, it was a great campaign. I love that campaign. I, I think I'm one of the only people in the press who like that campaign. I, I loved it. I thought it was great you because did? by yeah. that time they had fixed a lot of the issues that people mm -hmm. had. Um, yeah. And you know, again, it was bad timing. It, it required it, it required a lot of CPU. It required a lot of horsepower. Uh, also, it was a conversion to 64 bit mm -hmm. because at that yep. time there, everything was going 64 bit. It was a lot of issues initially, but by you know the second yeah. service pack, they. They kind of got their act together, but it's too late at that point. When you see a Vista machine, you kind of sigh. Yeah. You know, you're like, ah, I got to do this. Yeah. yeah. Because you, you have been critical of Windows 8 for a while. I mean, as far as. I think all the way along yeah. I was. Have you changed your your opinion of it over the last, you know, year, the course of the mm -hmm. year with the updates and, and some of these, you know, small changes to the operating system? Or yeah. are you still, I'm not I'm not a fan of it. I, I'm still not a total fan, um, but once they did the first update in um, in April, I was like, all right, let me give this another chance because they fixed a lot of the things that I really, really did not like about Windows 8. And um, that's when I bought my laptop. I, I had been holding off on buying a laptop because I'm like, oh, I really don't want a Windows 8 laptop. Wow. I really don't think I'm going to be productive with this. I don't like it. And, you know, it's it was okay on my Surface RT. I bought a Surface RT and I was using it on there. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. But I would never grab that device um, and feel really confident and taking it on the road with me somewhere like that I could get real work done. But now with my Windows 8 laptop, because I have 8.1 on it, I do feel like I can get stuff done. I, I'm still, I, I don't know. It, it's something for me. I mean, even with 8.1, I was using it. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. Uh, I could definitely get the hang of this. It still, to me, it still feels like it's two operating systems in one, which it kind it of is. You know, it's yeah, still it kind is. of uh, patched together in a way. But I know mm -hmm. other people that absolutely love it. And me too. They, they yep. would not trade it in for anything. They And, you know, mm -hmm. somebody brought this up. I can't remember who it was. And this whole, the yelling and screaming about the start menu. And he had a really good point. He, he tweeted me and goes, think about it. How about all the people that go from Windows to Mac, you know, the Mac OS? Mm -hmm. Nobody is talking about a start menu. Nobody right. says, where is the start menu on this thing? <laughs> yeah. And he pretty much said <clears throat> it's it's the fact that this is not a new operating system and this is an existing operating system that removed something that has caused people such heartache. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with it having it or not having it. You just don't want to change. And you know what? I kind of understand him and I and I get his point. Yeah. I don't care about the start menu. Like so many people kid me and they're like, oh, you're just waiting for the start menu. You don't want to not have the start menu. I barely even use the start menu in Windows 7. I, I almost don't even use it. And I definitely don't use it or miss it in Windows 8. It, it's more the case of that kind of disjointed feel in the operating system. Um, I'm basically living in the desktop. And that's basically Windows 7.5, if you want to think of it yeah, like yeah. that. And that works for me. It works with the way I work. Um when I try to go all Metro or mostly Metro, there's always things I'm like, oh, how do I do that again? I have to use IE, but I want to use Chrome. And yeah, there's just a bunch of things I, I feel like I'm kind of stymied by. So we are looking at a preview coming up soon within the next couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. Supposedly, yeah. Like um, the, the word is we're going to see a public preview uh, maybe o late October, early November, somewhere in that window. Um that would that would make a lot of sense because we keep hearing that threshold's supposed to be out in the spring of 2015, so that would be perfect timing for a public preview. So, I mean, we're talking this this operating system should be a, a near complete version, considering a lot of the mm -hmm. the features would have been put into you know this update that we just got this week. Yeah, yep. Um, um, so yeah, it'll have 
we believe, I should say we believe because, you know, we don't know this for a fact. They can always cut features even now, but we think there's going to be the mini start menu, as we call it, which is meant to reflect that it's not going to be the same start menu that's in Windows 7. We think we're going to get the uh, windowed Metro style apps on the desktop. So that'll be really great um, because that'll make it feel less disjointed to people who live on the desktop. Uh, we're supposed to get the removal either in total or at least in part of the charms bar, you know, which when you swipe in on the, on the right, you get those charms. Uh, I hear those are going away completely. Not even like that. They're not even going to be there on tablets. And oh, I don't even know on that's, tablets. Yeah. I hear it may go away totally because what they're doing is they're taking these things that were the charms and they're finding other ways to present them that people seem to be able to find more easily and use more easily. So you know how you have the share charm now. Um, I mean, I mean the search charm. Um, right now, if you have a tablet, you have a search button on your on your start screen, so you don't really need. So why the share do you charm. even need it? Yeah. I mean the search charm. But what's not going to go away are the app contracts. So they're still going to have a way that if you want to share something quickly, it's going to be built into the app or built into the operating system in some way. So it'll just be those things that are the charms that are going away, not the underlying idea of being able to share between apps. Do we know if there's going to be uh, significant changes between the preview version and the final version in April? Probably not significant at that point, um, but there still could be tweaks based on what people tell them. Like if people come back and say, I absolutely hate what you're doing with um, this new, uh, another new feature that they're going to add supposedly, which is uh, virtual desktops. I hate the virtual desktops. It doesn't work. Um, if the, if people came back in, on mass and said that, I think they would tweak it. But virtual desktops has have been around on the NT yep. version for for mm -hmm. for years. They have, and also I hear because I'm not a, an Apple user. I hear on Mac um, sure. they've been around, and Ubuntu they've been around. So yeah, it's something Microsoft hasn't had in desktop Windows, but they're going to add it. We hear. I, 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 this is this really for someone that you know. I'm a fan of Microsoft. I'm a fan of anything that I that I use. Really, I'm not. I'm not really committed to an ecosystem or an operating system. I don't. I don't commit to brands. Mm. Uh, I don't. For me, this is just another thing where wow, okay, this this helps somebody. This this is a this is a positive. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, this is going backwards. I don't think it's going backwards. You have to listen to your end user. You do. And if you don't. You're going to have yep. some issues. I mean, we've seen that happen in the past. And, you know, Windows 8 is a great example of that. Now, the mm -hmm. other question is, um, what are they going to do with pricing? Because are they going to, I've heard free, I've heard free for eight, I've heard free for seven. I've even heard XP. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea if you have XP to put Windows 9 on there or in the next version of Windows. I, it may be time yeah. to kind of, you know, retire that computer at that point. But yeah, <laughs> um, what, what do you what do you see happening? What have you heard and what do you think will happen? So what I've heard from a couple of my sources that it could be free and free for all, all of the people you just referenced, XP, Windows 7, Vista, and Windows 8. I heard that, that, that that's just an idea at this point that's on the table. And the reason they're thinking about doing this is they want everybody to be upgraded to the same baseline, right? It's super hard if you're Microsoft to have to be patching all these different versions of Windows that everybody's on all the time. And... The idea would be, let's get everybody to either commit to moving to it um, or at least get on the track of moving toward it. And the best way, one of the best ways you can do that is to make it free. If you're on a certain operating system by such and such a date, um, you say to them, hey, you can get it for free. Uh, but you know what? Pricing is one of the last things that that the Windows team traditionally decides on. So I don't think it's been decided yet. I think it's just kind of at this point an idea. I mean, on the Mac side, they're they're doing it for free, but Apple doesn't make any money off the OS ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, they 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 could give it away for free because you're buying the hardware and you're committing to their their ecosystem. For Microsoft, this would be a a, a big change. This would be humongous actually to yep. do that. Um, is XP a good idea? I don't know. I mean, I can see yeah. Windows 8. If you have Windows 8, you could get a free copy of the next version and you continue it on from there, but you have to cut it off at some point. Yeah. Uh, it's astonishing I, how many people are still on XP. Oh, I, mean, I it's, know. It's unbelievable. It is. And, you know, a lot of the ones I talk to, it's because of money. <laughs> and, and they're like, you know what? It's not broken. I'm cheap. I'm not going to spend. And I've, if that operating system's not free, I'm not doing it. That's amazing. 
I, I mean, I'm curious. I mean, we have a chat room. We have about 155 people in the chat room right now. I'd love to know how many of you are on XP. And I'm not talking about work. We're not talking about, you know, yeah. your work computer. I'm saying your, your, your everyday computer. Are you using XP on an everyday basis? I, I'd be surprised to see, you know, how many people are doing that. It's, it's amazing to me. But this yeah. is all good stuff. Do you attribute this to the CEO or was this all put in place prior to the new CEO coming in? You know, it's it's hard to say exactly when a lot of these decisions were made because um, a, a lot of these things are things that can't have happened as quickly as overnight. You know, like uh, everybody was like, oh, Steve Ballmer never would have released Office for iPad before the touch Office for Windows. Well, he was the one who decided that. He was the one who put that decision in, in process and made it happen. So even though it happened under Satya Nadella, it was Ballmer's decision. So I don't know how much of this change in pricing around windows, um, can be traced back to Balmer. You know, the idea of making it free on devices, nine inches and under, um, to try to stimulate the ecosystem and all that. I don't know if that was him or it was Satya who came in and said, you know what, this is what we're doing. Change in plans. I mean, regardless of who it was, it, it kind of looks good for, you know, Nadella because he's this new guy coming in and look yeah. at all these changes. It's a new Microsoft when in reality, you know, yeah. things like this take time to kind yep. of change. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about for a second. I want to I want to take a little break and I want to talk about the uh, event you're going to be speaking speaking at in September with Paul Thorat, and that's IT Dev Connections. Uh, you do it. I think every year you've been doing it, right? The last couple of years. Yeah. Well, this is going to be my second year doing it. Uh, you guys are going to be talking. You have a panel going, and the panel will be on um, on the state of Microsoft. Uh, tell me a little bit about the panel that you're going to be speaking on. What can people expect? Because this is awesome. This is actually a really uh, awesome conference. And I know a lot of people, a lot of our viewers attend it every year. They're in they're in the business. They they This is something that they, that they always go to. So tell me a little bit about the panel and, and what to expect from it. Yeah. So um, what we did last year, we had like, I think we had like four slides. And we're just like, here's what we think is going on at Microsoft right now and things that you should be aware of as an IT pro and a dev. And then we just opened it up to questions because that just, it, it just works way better. We don't really know what every person wants to know. And we have so many diverse interests in the audience. So we just took live questions and kind of debated among ourselves on the stage and with other people in the audience about, do you think this is going to happen? What's the likelihood, you know, of them doing this with windows or this with system center or you know, where, where they're going with Azure. We talk about pretty much any topic that people want to talk about. Management, who's in, who's out, um, rumors. We'll, we'll do whatever people want to do in the audience. So it's kind of fun if you just want to kind of pick our brains about things we've heard, source, what sources have been telling us. We'll, we'll tell you what we know. Uh, how long do you guys do it for? Do you have like a set time or? Because I can yeah, I I we... imagine it going on forever with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We cut it off at about, I think, an hour or so of questions. And then we, we uh, retire to a craft beer bar for further discussion. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, IT Dev Connections. Uh, it's devconnections.com. That's the website. And they, they have a, actually a really cool offer code uh, for uh, people registering. If you do Tech 14, you could save 200 bucks uh, signing up. And this is awesome. It's in Las Vegas. Great place to be. September is a phenomenal time to go. Uh, I'm making a trip out to California, and we were considering making a stop in Vegas for a couple days, and we would go at this time. So I think it would be a lot of fun. We would all get a couple drinks and have a good time. Yep. And I'm I'm also going to do one other thing that I didn't do last year. Um, Brad Anderson from Microsoft is speaking at this event. He's the head of uh, mobile enterprise client and mobility in the cloud and enterprise division. And I'm going to get to do an onstage Q&A with him after he does his keynote. Um, so that could be kind of fun too. Which day are you guys speaking? Oh man, what day are we speaking? I think we're speaking on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. I can't remember right now. Um, cause there's a lot of different things going on. It starts on Monday and that's when Brad Anderson's speaking. Uh, awesome. so yeah. that's awesome. Uh, devconnections.com. Everybody should go check it out and, uh, let them know that we told you about it because they're, uh, it's an awesome, awesome conference and it's really great for the industry. Uh, MJ, your video froze. Oh, again. Yeah. You know what? I what we need to figure this out. <laughs> we have all these people watching. Somebody, if you tell have us. ideas, yeah, send it to MJ because uh, yeah, we love to. I don't know. know. It's, this has just started happening in the past couple weeks, so I'm That's not so sure weird. 
what so is weird. going on. Could be a USB issue. Could it? It could be. It could be yeah. that it's uh it's it's losing a connection on that port. Something's going on. Yeah. Uh, I have a, I didn't put this in the notes, but I want to get your opinion on this. I want to I want to know what your opinion of the Chromebooks are because uh, there was a story saying that you know they they're selling a lot more of these and they're gaining some market share. Uh, people are going over these Chromebooks. Do you see this as a viable threat to Windows and and the business of Windows and, and the business of the PC as far as you know that entry level PC goes? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I don't want to minimize the threat of Chromebooks, and I think Microsoft is very aware of, of it th- themselves. If you go on their website, they've got a bunch of promotional things about how they compare to Chromebook and what they can do that Chrome can't, Chromebook can't. So they obviously are taking it as a credible threat. And the place I think where they're most watching it is in the education market because that's where most of these Chromebooks, at least in the U.S., have been sold to date. And, you know, we're not talking about a lot of Chromebooks. Um, I, I saw the numbers recently. It's about, uh, it's way, it's, it's considerably under 5% of the total PC, PC. Uh, PC market sales. So we're not talking about something that's like looming and that Microsoft's is, is running. Is that global? From. Are we talking global numbers? Or? I think it was 5% was global, I believe. Okay. Um, I so mean, that's half about, of Apple. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, so it's nothing, they can't just dismiss it, but I think they also are being um, somewhat realistic and saying, you know what, we don't want to go down the path that we did with the iPhone and kind of poo-poo it, and then suddenly it's this big thing. Um, where where they're competing heavily with them is on price, because there really haven't been Windows PCs, or not at least not many of them, since netbooks in the $200, 250 range. And this fall, we're going to start seeing a lot more of those for better or for worse. And that's where Microsoft's going to emphasize, hey, if you want to get into the market in that space, if you only have 250 bucks to pay because of price sensitivity here, get this PC instead of this, this Chromebook. I'm trying to find what the uh, Mac global uh, market share is. Isn't it five also? <sighs> I, I saw five and then I I think domestically it was like ten. Yeah, domestically. Okay, yeah, it's that's higher. what it is. Domestically yeah. it's ten. But look how long they've been in the market. I know. Yeah. And you look at Google just entering this within a year, mm-hmm. two years, and they've been able to grab you know five percent. Yep. I'm I'm just curious because you're right. The that education you know market uh, is up for grabs really because whatever's going to be the the, the least cost is going to be the one that they go to, really. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know, like if you say it in Bay Trail, Clover Trail, Arm, like, you know, the average consumer doesn't really know yeah. this. And um, so, you know, you can go in the store and say, which of these is the cheapest? That one. And you know what? The reality is, I'm, I'm talking about the pros. Obviously, there's a lot of cons on why you shouldn't get it, but it's 199 bucks or 299 bucks. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to worry about malware. You don't have to worry about viruses. Uh, if your kid is on this thing and he breaks it, you don't have to worry about that. It's a disposable computer. It's an appliance more than anything else. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the price is something that a lot of the tablets have not been able to do. A $199 tablet is not going to be a very effective tablet for you. You're going to have some issues with it. Uh, the iPad is 500 bucks. That's a PC. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. just the further development of this now, the fact that they're going to be able to run Android applications on this thing, uh, mm-hmm. it is, it, it, they should be concerned. Yeah, they are. I would say they are. Um, I, I don't think they're just dismissing it at all. And the, you know, one thing they haven't p- ported to Chrome, uh, the Chrome OS is Skype. And I, I wonder if they ever will, because they are using that as a selling point and saying, you know what, Skype, if you want Skype, you can't use it on a Chromebook. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, they just put Skype on the uh, the Fire Phone, so it, it's yeah. it, it's interesting how they're holding on to that. But you don't need to use Skype; they have Google Hangouts. Yep, you, you know? know. So it, it's becoming a it's it's fascinating to me. I know a lot of people have gotten these Chromebooks, and everybody has pretty much the same answer. Everybody says this is not a a this is not a work computer replacement for most people, mm-hmm. but it is a really low cost computer that's pretty good as as far as performance goes. Mm-hmm. You can watch 1080p content on there. You could do your video chats on there. So you're getting the job done. So instead of going and buying a $400 laptop as your secondary computer, you could buy this and it gets it all done. 
And mm-hmm. you know that that's that's not that great when you, when people are jumping ship and they're going to this. Or yep. it could be a fad. I mean, who knows? Uh, we saw what happened with the netbooks. Right. Uh, have right. have they come up with a plan as far as you know the next generation of these low cost Windows laptops? I know that you know Intel has a new chipset coming out where it's mm-hmm. going to be essentially fanless. It's a fourteen millimeter, uh, fourteen nanometer chipset, and it's going to be low cost, and you're going to be able to have a whole bunch of new kind of PCs out there without fans and you could kind of do that with, but have they been contemplating what their answer to this is going to be in the long run? Yeah, they just, they keep emphasizing um, the OEM machines that are coming out that are going to be in the $250 range. And they're like, you know what, if you really need a low cost PC, this is what we would advise. Um, I think a lot of them are running at them. So they're not going to be amazing experiences, but if you're putting this up against Chromebook, it probably will hold up pretty closely. My dog doesn't like the word Chromebook. He doesn't. Huh? Every wow. time we said Chromebook, he started growling. I, I have no idea what's going on with that. I what's wanna... his name? Is his name Balmer? No, it's Spencer. Spencer. <laughs> is, there, is there a Spencer high up in the uh, Microsoft rankings? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so I want to, um, I, I got this email uh, the other day when I, when I said that I was going to have you on. People want to know what you're using now. And people are always yep. interested in what Paul's using, and, and Paul changes his setup all the time. I'm curious, yep. what is what is your everyday computer? What are you using every day? What applications do you use every day? Um, I love to, to learn from people because I'm on a Mac right now, and yep. I, I like my MacBook. Listen, mm-hmm. MJ, I just want to tell you, I told everybody, we, we went out, we had a couple drinks, and you said to me, maybe I'll get a MacBook Pro. Yeah, that was, that was when I was having a lot of... <laughs> Bad feelings about Windows 8. <laughs> you were contemplating it. You might have. I you, was. It was. It, you were close. I, you know, it would take a lot for me to do that. But um, I was actually thinking about it because, uh, you know, at the start of this year, well, late last year and at the start of this year, I was in the market for a new laptop. Um, I hadn't replaced my laptop in about three years and it was running, uh, I think, an Intel Core Duo. It was really getting slow, you know, and um I really wanted to buy a new machine, but I was just not seeing good battery life on anything I was looking at. And they were expensive. And I, I, I just kept thinking, wow, I'm in the Mac, MacBook Pro and MacBook Air price range right now and things I'm looking at. And they have 14-hour battery life, so maybe I should get a MacBook. Would you have run the operating system or would you have immediately put Windows on that thing? I would have put Windows on it, but you know why? I, I've tried to use Mac OS before, and everybody's like, oh, it's so easy to use. And if you're really used to Windows, it's not so easy to no, use. No, it's not. I, I, you're absolutely no. right. You're absolutely right. And and I, I just had to – it's so funny. I was talking to somebody this morning about this. Uh-huh. If you are used to something and you, and you automatically – you know, you take a new MacBook, and everybody says, no, 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 you could jump ship. It's so easy on the Mac. It's harder on Windows. It's not. It, it's no. – it, there's a learning curve. And – for me, the most difficult thing was uh, at closing out applications. Mm-hmm. Like you don't really, if you hit X, yeah. first of all, it's on yeah. the other side, which is crazy. <laughs> it's on the left side. Yeah. But when you close out an application, you're not really closing out the application. Right. You got to do that command Q thing to shut down an yeah. application. That was weird for me to adjust to. Yep. Now, I mean, I've been using it for a couple of years. It, it's, it's fine. I, I know what yep. I'm doing now. But it, you probably need to use it at least three to six months to get the hang of everything. Yeah. And I, I just am, I, unlike Paul, Paul switches up what he's using all the time. And like you guys do, um, just to be familiar with things, but I am a creature of habit and I don't want to spend a lot of time learning something just so I can get my basic work done. So I'm using as my main, uh, machine, a Dell, um, I forget the brand of this Optiplex, um, Windows seven machine. That's like a 21 inch. That's, that's, big, that's your home machine. Big boy. Yeah. He's on my desk. And uh, I'm not upgrading this to Windows 8. It doesn't need Windows 8. It's not a touch device. And I use it with a mouse and a keyboard. And that is my daily driver. That's what I do most of my work on. Um, As far as my mobile machine, I bought this year an Acer Aspire S7, which um, is a really nice laptop that I spent a lot of money for. I spent um, close to $2,000 on it. That's that's a lot of money. Yeah, it's but it's a great machine. Super thin, light, has about eight hour battery. Uh, Sometimes I even get a little more than that. Um, It's running Windows 8.1 update, and it's been excellent. It's been really sturdy, clamshell design. Uh, I use it on the road. It's been just great. No, no problems at all with that thing. 
And then I also still have my Surface RT, which I kind of use just when I'm sitting around at home, at, like I would use an iPad. I used to have an iPad and I replaced it with the Surface RT. So I still use that every once in a while. So you, you are using the, the Metro UI? Yeah, okay. I, I do use it when I use that especially. And I use it on my um, laptop. Have you, uh, the chat room wants to know, and guys, if you have any questions, we got a couple minutes, so uh, we could do questions. And after the show, MJ, if you if you have some time, I'd like to hang out and talk about beer with you a little bit. We do okay. we do an after sure. show called What the Talk. Uh, nice. It's a bonus okay. show we put on Patreon, and I think it's a good time cool. to talk about this. While, while yeah. you guys are, are lining up questions for MJ, uh, let, me, let me give a little plug for our Patreon campaign. So if you, uh, we want to keep the show as ad-free as possible. We try not to bombard you with three or four ads per show. And the way that we do that is by your support. We have a Patreon campaign. If you go to patreon.com slash what the tech, you could fund our campaign. And we have goals set up. We're almost at 500 bucks for the goal. And at $500, we're going to do a live monthly call-in show where you guys call in. Uh, we talk to you about your questions. Uh, you could harass Paul. You could harass me. Uh, maybe M MJ, if she wants to come on, you could, you could talk to her too. Uh, you could ask her all the beer questions you want. Uh, so we have all these different goals set up and we, you know, anything from a dollar to five bucks to, uh, 50 cents people are funding. And so it's unbelievable to see how many people come out and they are actually supporting the show. Uh, again, patreon.com that's patreon.com slash what the tech you could, uh, fund our, fund our show from there. So we do this after show and people actually love it. We call it what the talk and we just talk about anything. So I'd love to talk a little bit about beer with, with you Yeah, yeah. because, uh, yeah. I've learned so much. <laughs> from you and Paul and and it, I've I've totally converted over to uh, craft beers at this point. Um, so this is a question in the chat room. A three four zero asks, ask MJ if she's played with Linux and what are her thoughts of Linux. Nope, I have not. I I actually um, <laughs> where was I? I went to OSCON one year and I sat down in the press room. They had a bunch of terminals and I started to type something else and I'm like, I think I'm using Linux. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so no i i have not used linux i've written about linux quite a bit but i have not used it i'll tell you it's gotten a lot easier yeah i know it has it, because it almost looked like windows when i saw it i was like wait it looks kind of like i could figure this out my first linux experience was red hat 6 and it really uh deferred me from continuing to use it because it was so overly you know it's not yeah. it's not friendly for a novice but no. uh, ubuntu i mean they've made it super super easy Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. MJ, what apps do you use uh, in RT? On uh, RT. So I use the Mail app. Um, I like that quite a bit. I actually even use that on my um, laptop, too. <laughs> Every time I use it, Paul looks over and he's like, are you using the Mail app? Why? <laughs> what, what does he use? Outlook? <laughs> he, I, yeah, he, he goes uh, Outlook web app, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't hate it. I think I think they've done a lot of good work on it and fixed it up a lot. I use um, Notepad RT sometimes and when I'm not using plain old Notepad. Um, what else do I use? I use um, the Bing um, recipe app. I think it's called Bing Food and Drink. I like that. I like the weather app. Um, I have played some of the games um, that they've got. Like a, I think they've got a Mahjong that works on RT. I'm not, a, as you guys know, I'm not a Xbox game person, but I, I sometimes play Mahjong. That's like my one game that I play. I play <laughs> like like Flipcoin on my iPad. That's as far as I go. Yeah, I'm not a big gamer yeah. either. Uh, yeah. I was, you know, it, it's weird. Uh, I, I used to play a lot and then I got married and yeah. Jess was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you playing a video game? Don't, aren't you working? <laughs> yeah, I am working. This is how like, I work. This is my job. This is my job. <laughs> so no, I just I just kind of stopped playing games. I mean, it's just yeah, it's weird. Well. Uh, how did you meet Paul? How did I meet Paul? Oops, let me fix my video. Um, I've known Paul for a really long time. Uh, we because we both have been tech reporters covering Microsoft for a long time. I don't remember when I first met him. Wasn't but he a I jerk tell to you? He was a jerk oh, to you, right? You know what's funny? I tell everybody this, and he he is actually corroborating my story now. Um, we hated each other. We used to absolutely hate each other because we felt like we were competitors and he'd write something and I'd be like, grr, grr. And then he, I'd write something and he'd hate it. And uh, Todd Bishop, who works at GeekWire in the end, said, said to Paul one day, you know, do you ever read any other Microsoft journalists? And he said, no, I don't read any. <laughs> and Todd was like, that's a I very good Paul Mary answer, Joe. by the Come way. That, that's exactly how <laughs> Paul would say it too. Yeah. And, no. Uh, 
he's like, come on, you must read Mary Jo because she does what you do and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Paul's like, yeah, I, yeah, I read her. And then he said he was kind of thinking about it the next night. And he's like, I should invite her to come on with me and see, it, you know, on Windows Weekly just to see what happens. And that's how I ended up doing the show and getting to know him. And you better. were upside down the first time. I was. <laughs> you remember that? I do. Oh, man. I do. Oh, yeah, I watched I it and I was yelling driver. at I was I was yelling at the screen the entire time. I'm like, your driver, it's your driver. It was my driver, but it, at that point it was too late to change it. And everybody was like trying to send me downloads of drivers and it was just a nightmare. It's hysterical. <laughs> um, let's see what else people are asking and then we'll wrap it up and we'll do our uh, after show. Okay. Oh, uh, what apps do you use on Windows Phone? On Windows Phone, let's yeah. see. Uh, Untapped, of course, the beer app is one of my big ones. Um, I use OneNote to take simple notes, just if I'm doing like shopping or whatever. Um, OneDrive, Outlook, IE. I use for my Twitter client, Meadow, M-E-H-D-O-H. I'm still using them. I still like them a lot. Um, I have Google, a big Google button on my phone because sometimes Bing isn't just finding what I need. Uh, I have the Amtrak app. I have, um, oh, what's the trip app I use? It's really great. My Trips, which is a client for TripIt, I use this all the time to keep track of all my travel. Um, so yeah, I'm always trying different apps to see if anything else is kind of interesting or comes to mind. Um, I have um, a really funny app called Microsoft Campus Maps on here. So if you're ever on the Microsoft Campus, you can find your way around much easier oh, with, this, so with these maps. Uh, Eric in our chat wants to know what you think of Windows Media Center. Windows Media Center. I've never used that. You know, I, I've used it a couple times, yeah. I, I've, and I know people love it, and this I is know. something that comes up all the time. Yeah, um, I know. I just, I just never had a need to use it, but I, can, I, I know plenty of people like, oh, no, this is, it's awful that Media Center is going away. I know. And, and you know, if I, if I was somebody who cared more about games and TV, I'm sure I would really care about it, but I don't have a TV, and I don't play games, so not that interesting to me. It's time to wrap it up, MJ. Okay. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, thanks. It's always again. fun with you. Uh, check out anything MG's doing. Where can people find out more? I mean, obviously your Twitter, follow you on Twitter, but where else can people go to get more information uh, about what you're doing? Yeah, Twitter is the main one. And then my blog is all about Microsoft.com. That's on ZDNet. I also do a column, a monthly column on Redmond Magazine. So if you do RedmondMag.com, I write their back page column. And I always write about some issue of the month having to do with Microsoft. So I'm there sometimes on news.com, uh, CNET. Very busy here and there. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course we want your beer blog. We need you to have a beer blog. I kind of need to have one. Yeah. I think I it's think. time. I think it's time. Uh, <laughs> Mary jo and of course, uh, windows weekly, right? Every of course, Wednesday. I, yeah. Every is, Wednesday we do windows weekly. Is Paul on with you tomorrow? No, t Paul is not on tomorrow because he's on vacation. So tomorrow I have as my guest Daniel Rubino from WP Central. He's oh, awesome. Guest. Oh, that's a good guest. Yeah, he's good. Awesome. Wednesdays at 2 p.m. East on the Twit Network. You can go to live.twit.tv to check it out. Or of course, uh, twit.tv just to uh, watch it after the fact. Uh, guys, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If you're watching live, you can stay tuned. We could, uh, we're going to hang out and, and talk a little bit more. Uh, if not, uh, this is the end of the show, and we'll see you all next week.